On a planet called Origin, where lots of life is suspiciously similar to life on Earth, lots of arthropods evolved ways to support a larger body. In this video, I'll talk about three distantly related arthropods and their separately evolved adaptations for large bodies. The only flying arachnid lives on an island called Senex. The island is mostly desert, and this arachnid once hunted in pits under the sand. However, in an attempt to gain food, the spider learned to jump and catch flying prey. As time flowed, pit tarantulas and jumping spiders became separate species, and little by little the spiders had membranes between their legs that allowed for powered flight. Their front and second legs have membranes to make the main wings, and their two back legs have membranes to make the tail rudder, and their third legs are strong and muscular to allow for jumping into the air. Here's the final art. The tarantula hawk is a flying carnivore with a 1 meter wingspan. Their only natural predators are the cowbird and the roadrunner, and they've been seen eating pretty much any kind of small animal from bugs to lizards to birds to mice. But how'd they evolve? Well, to figure that out, let's look at their closest relative. The pit tarantula has a sturdy exoskeleton to support itself under the sand, but it's got a strange apparatus made of its back two legs over its soft abdomen. Millions of years ago, all arthropods had passive respiratory and vascular systems, which was fine because oxygen and other nutrients suffuse across their small bodies. But in this low oxygen environment under the sand, the pit tarantula had to adapt. Its book lungs and tracheal tubes grew and multiplied to become something like a tetrapod's lungs. Its heart is also much bigger to circulate the oxygen and other nutrients around their body in a vascular system. So its soft abdomen can expand and contract without the pressure of sand under them, they also have an apparatus over it to allow for room to breathe. To get back to the tarantula hawk, they have a mostly soft and sometimes non-existent exoskeleton that not only allows their abdomen to expand and contract easily, but also lightens them for flight. Their heart and lungs seem to be efficient enough to support a fast metabolism, and the tarantula hawk is one of the few homeothermic or warm-blooded arthropods. The largest insect in Senex is arguably their apex predator though its position in that ties with the cowbird. It has a similar hunting style as the pit tarantula, but it lives further west, though their prey doesn't really overlap thanks to the size difference. This animal has four legs and a very fluffy body paired with huge insectoid jaws. They spend most of their life in a huge sand pit, and anything that falls even on the edge is likely to sink into the pit. Basically, it's a six meter radius of quicksand surrounding a pit where a carnivore lives. If something fights to escape, the carnivore is likely to jump out of its pit and drag the struggling prey under. Here's the final art. The dust lion is a neuropteran insect that spends most of its life in its larval stage. During this time, it's a 2 meter long apex predator that hunts anything on the ground. They have long legs and can jump out of their pit if they have to, though usually they stay in and are around the same one from 7 to 14 years. They would arguably be more dangerous if they didn't do this, but it's probably worth the energy to sit and wait rather than roam around. That's just a theory though. Okay. Every seven years like clockwork, a big percentage of them pupate. Seventh month of the year, they all emerge as adult aguins. They have no mouths and only live for a day. In the morning till afternoon, they sit still, drying out their wings in the sun. At dusk, they all take flight, coming together in a huge swarm. It's a huge local event, often called the Senex New Year. Although aguings are much smaller than their larval stage, they're still pretty big. Their bodies are often longer than a meter. The males are smaller and darkly colored while the females are larger and colored like the sunset sky. Before the sun rises again, they fall one by one as they run out of energy. In the morning, villagers come together to clean up and use the bodies as fertilizer for the next harvest. Okay, but how they get so big? This video is called Speculative Evolution, not Speculative Anthropology. Hey, that's a good idea. Anyway, a lot of it comes down to the respiratory and circulatory system again, but there's a little more too. The respiratory systems of primitive insects come down mostly to spiracles that let in air and tracheal tubes that allow it to diffuse about the body. Like I mentioned before, that's not efficient enough for a large-bodied organism. The dust lion has evolved lungs, though his nostrils are closer to his abdomen, which is actually more common for arthropods, and can be seen in most of them like lichens and horsefly. Rather than having hemolymph that just washes the organs and nutrients so it can diffuse, dust lions have a full circulatory system as well. But hold on, they're so big. How does their exoskeleton expand and contract for all these processes, and how do they manage to shed these huge exoskeletons? Well, in the dust lion's case, their exoskeleton is soft like a caterpillar, or a grub, or a maggot, 
uh, or a caterpillar, I can't think of any other insect larva. But what makes them special is that they have extra hard pieces within their body, specifically legs and head, to hold their shape, almost like an endoskeleton. It evolved from their exoskeleton, so it's made from similar stuff. Thanks to their stretchy exoskeleton, they have no need to molt as they grow, and while their abdomen is a weak point, no one really wants to get that close to this thing either. The adult form looks more like what we're used to, though its exoskeleton is mostly hollow with a honeycomb structure to lose weight without losing too much strength. They also have something like a spine along with lungs and a heart, so their abdomen is plated to allow room for expansion and contraction. Giant arthropods aren't as common in the Orient, but there is one that lives in the human jungle. This one's closely related to the horsefly, but its closest living relative is the pesky mosquito that's been getting more and more common as temperatures all over origin have been rising. While mosquitoes feed on the blood of humans without directly harming them, this animal feeds on the entire body of its prey until it's dry bone. This prey can be human, and this is one of the few animals that actively seeks and hunts humanoids. Here's the final art. El Mosco is a dipteran insect that's an obligate carnivore. It's named after the mythical kingfly of Middle Anthropogen folklore. There's minor sexual dimorphism where the males are smaller, have fluffier antennae, and limited mouth parts. The males don't eat after emerging from the pupa, so they spend most of their time trying to mate before they die in a few days. Before we learn about their evolution, let's look at their metamorphosis. After hatching from a pile of 20 centimeter long eggs in a pond, they immediately begin eating what they can. The pile of eggs hatch irregularly, and most of the time, the first one or two will hatch to eat the rest of the eggs. As one of the more derived forms of insects, they have a fully developed endoskeleton, lungs, and heart, though this endoskeleton is soft until they exit the water. A lot of what used to be their exoskeleton is part of their skin and scales. The larvae are called false frogs because of how closely they resemble tadpoles and frogs during their development. When they're big enough to, from eating in the water, they grow legs and go through a mini metamorphosis to continue eating on land. At this point, their skeleton has hardened. They don't look a whole lot like frogs, but maybe you can see the resemblance. They eat what they can, sometimes cleaning trees of all their soft parts. They can keep growing for extended periods, the largest of which have been measured at 2,000 kilograms. They come back to water to pupate, usually guarded by the adult who guards the eggs. So how did their endoskeleton evolve? It seems to have been a process comparable to cephalopods, except instead of the shell entering their body, it was the exoskeleton becoming something like a spine in the endoskeleton and legs. They developed something like ribs in their abdomen, which is where most of their vital organs are. El Mosco is a dense and heavy animal, the biggest females can weigh 900 kilograms when engorged. The animal is very culturally important, and a huge part of the only society in a secluded region called the Dives. Humans are a strange and derived sapient species of feliform mammals that might seem like they don't belong in this video. Well, that would be right, so I won't talk about them or their evolution deeply. What I will talk about is that they have a unique ability to fuse their being with other organisms, using strong spiritual magic. Yeah, if you're not familiar with my stuff, there's a whole magic system, check out my last Vekiva video for more about that whole thing in general. Anyway, this process must be done carefully to ensure the mind of the human isn't lost in the mind of whatever they fuse with. So the features of the human are usually much stronger than the features of whatever else, like in these examples. In the dives, this care is tossed to the wind. A tribe of humans in the dives fuse themselves with El Mosco at a young age, losing themselves in the monstrous drive of the carnivorous insect. Their more traditional neighbors call them vampires and tell scary stories of them, but obviously if vampires aren't real, that would be crazy and silly and there's no way mythical beings like that could exist. I'll talk more about the dives' spiritual fusion humans and humanoids in general later in the year, but for now that's all for that. That's also all for this video. Originally I was going to include crocodile scorpions and sapien insects in this, but I want to give more time to those, specifically sapien insects. Also I probably shouldn't be spending this much time on my videos when I got school to do. Check out my Patreon where you can subscribe for $1 a month to support me and get your name at the end of my videos. Thanks Captain Kobot. And thanks, Art of Dying. My next Spike Evo video will be about life as we don't know it. Before then, there'll also be a new kind of video. Speculative anthropology about origins only sapient dragons. I hope you'll enjoy that one too. Thanks for watching. Whew, I wonder how many times I accidentally switched exoskeleton and endoskeleton. <laughs>